Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Mike Avery has covered the outdoors in Michigan for more than four decades, and that tradition continues today. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Jay Sporting Goods, the Eider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons and Polar Craft Boats, the Forward Corporation, Primal Tree Stands, Security Credit Union, Garber Chevrolet, Brenton USA Hunting Rifles, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Indeed, this is the big guy, Mike Avery, and welcome to another edition of the Outdoor Magazine radio show here on the Outdoor Magazine radio network. And as always, so glad to be back along with you. I, 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 I miss those days between the weekends when you and I can talk here on the radio show. You know, social media is great. And well, it's, it's great and it also stinks. But <laughs> I mean, I have a love-hate relationship with it. Uh, and, and we can interact during the week. You can uh, reach out to me on my Instagram. I'm Mike Avery Outdoors on Instagram. I'm Facebook. I'm Mike Avery Outdoors. Twitter. Who uses Twitter? I, 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 I post things to Twitter only because they've already been posted to Instagram or Facebook and they automatically go to Twitter. But I, there's nothing I do that is specifically and directly to, to uh, Twitter. But if you're on Twitter, I'm out there too. Again, Mike Avery. No, I'm uh, Avery Outdoors on Twitter. Not to be confused with the Waterfowl Company. Uh, I used to get um, messages from people asking me about my decoys or something like that or complaining about the products. I'm like, hey, this is the wrong Avery Outdoors. I, I, you know, a lot of things you can complain to me about, but that's not one of them. Anyway, so what's going on? Well, summertime is cruising right along, right? I mean, the 4th of July is behind us now. It's going to be Labor Day before we know it. And I'll tell you this again. Do not let this summertime slip away. I know gas prices are high. I know you, you got work to do. You've got a lot of other obligations, but please... This is the time of year when many Michigan families look forward to so much. Don't let it get to be January and February and have you look back and go, you know what, we should have done this. We should have gone there. We should have taken that trip. We should have taken that charter fishing trip. We should have taken that camping trip. We should have gone up north, whatever. Now is the time to make memories. Whether it's your kids your grandkids, your friends, your spouse, or just yourself. Take advantage of what this wonderful, beautiful state has to offer. Because it will be the fall hunting season before you know it. I will be bear hunting in Newberry this fall, the Newberry Bear Management Unit. Last week at 12.01 a.m. on July 5th, the DNR posted the drawing results for Michigan bear and elk tags. Jeez, what a surprise. I didn't get an elk tag. Nobody gets an elk tag. 50,000 people apply for elk permits, and they let out about 200 of them. So nobody gets them. All right, 200 people get them. But 200 out of 50,000, your odds are almost better to get struck by lightning than they are to get a Michigan elk tag. I hear from people all the time saying, I've been applying for an either sex, which is a, uh, for, a, for a cow tag, which is the easiest one to get, for 30, 35 years, and I can't get one. And then I hear from people, I heard from a, a, a person just, <sighs> I heard from a mom who her and her son both got elk tags, and one of them, after only applying, I think it was a bull tag, after applying for just four years. How do you figure? How does that work? I still don't know. I have had it explained to me a half a dozen times, and I still don't get it. And I apply for a Michigan elk tag every year, knowing that I will not get a Michigan elk tag. I know it, but I keep applying if I do ever get a Michigan elk tag, it'll be through the pure Michigan hunt. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced of that. But I am going to be bear hunting 
and I only had two points. Avery, how did you do that? I've been applying for years and years and years, and I've got 10, 12 points. I can't get a tag. Avery, how did you get one with just two points? Must be you've got some friends in the, in the DNR. No. Once I figured out and realized how the bear system works, it's pretty easy. If you pick the right area and the right season. For example, if I wanted to hunt the western UP, I could get a tag every year. But I wanted to hunt Newberry, the Newberry Bear Management Unit, because I wanted to hunt with my buddy Johnny Bowler, the Bear Whisperer. And I will be starting September 25th. Now, people will say, well, uh, you know, that third season, it's not very good. You know, dogs have been running, uh, bear dogs have been running in there, and the bears are spooky and such. They're uh, skittish. Not so much where Johnny hunts, right on the edge of Sini. They, they really don't run dogs in there because they don't want to take a chance those dogs will get over on the refuge because that's a no-no. So the bears that I'm going to be hunting basically don't know it's the third season. As far as they know, it's the first season. And I'm really, really looking forward to it. So it's going to be time to start getting ready. Well, I got, I got some fishing to do first, right? My fishing season isn't over. But then it's going to be time to start doing some shooting. Because I'm going to be heading to White River, Ontario on a bear hunt now in about five weeks. So it's time to pretty soon start shooting that dart and crossbow, getting ready for that. And then it'll be time to break out that Brenton 350 legend, Brenton USA hunting rifle, that I picked up a couple of weeks ago and have not shot yet. But I knew it. I knew I wasn't going to take time to get to know that gun and get it to the range until my fishing was done. But I am going to use that for my Michigan bear hunt. People say, well, that's not the best gun for a Michigan, for a bear hunt. I I get it. If I was going to buy a gun specifically for a bear hunt, I'd buy a 12-gauge slug gun. But I got the Brenton, the 350 Legend, is kind of an all-purpose rifle, and I'm confident it'll work very well on that Michigan bear. But as I say, I got some fishing to take care of first. My beloved Saginaw Bay walleye fishery that I've been an observer of and a participant in for more than 30 years now, since the walleye fishery was reestablished there, is pretty good this summer. And my skinny water is holding up, as, as we are in the studio right now, it's still holding up pretty good. Now, I do plan to fish tomorrow because the winds are going to be light and variable, and I have a trip this weekend. So I'm going to try to get out there tomorrow and see if they're still in the skinny water. People ask me all the time, what is skinny water? Well, it depends on who you're asking. Skinny water is shallow water. And that's a very subjective term. To some people, skinny water is six feet of water. To some people, skinny water is 12 feet of water. To me, skinny water is like ideally 10 feet or less. Although lately, I found myself out in 9 to 12 feet of water. Which I realize, if you're a Lake Michigan salmon fisherman, is absolutely nothing. You might as well be in two feet of water, right? I like the skinny water. I like the shallow water bite. I like it because with the fish, when they're in there, they're in there to feed and they're aggressive. I have found myself the uh, past few trips switching over to flicker minnows. I usually run number seven flicker shads. I've been running number seven flicker minnows. The fish have seemed to want that profile or that action lately. Also, And this is a technique I had used in the past, only out in deeper water. Spoons. Now, I'll be honest, I learned this trick from Lance Valentine. He said, even there in that skinny water, if you've got enough people on board, run a couple of bonus rods and put a spoon behind a number 30 jet diver 25 to 30 feet back. And every trip we have been picking up bonus fish, even in nine feet of water, using that tactic, that technique. So thank you, Lance, for that. I appreciate it. Uh, One recent trip was very memorable. I had the Grillo family of Michigan brand meats out on the boat. I had Butch, the patriarch, Joe, his son, Nick, his son, and Jojo, little Joe, Joe Jr., Joe's son, Butch's grandson. And again, in my skinny water, we got into some nice fish, including 
Little Joe, Jojo, I call him Jojo. They call him Jojo, too, so I think it's okay if I do. You got a master angler white bass, 17-and-a-half-inch white bass. The minute they pulled that aboard, I said, that's a master angler. Take a picture of it and, and be sure to submit. So it was... It made Joe's day, and it made my day. I love getting people out there who have not experienced big water fishing, although the Grillos have. I mean, they're very, very hardcore hunters and anglers. Uh, oh, the NRA is calling me. Don't call me, NRA. I support you, but quit calling me. I give you money. Quit asking me for more. I know you're doing a good job. If you need more money then ask me for it up front. Don't charge me a certain amount of money for a membership and then keep coming back for me asking for more money because you're not going to get it. If you need more money, then charge more right off the bat, but quit bugging me. Coming up on this week's Outdoor Magazine radio show after the break, Ron St. Louis of Northern Wilderness Bear Outfitters. If you didn't get your Michigan bear tag, you can still hunt bears this year. Just go north of the border to Ontario. So Ron St. Louis will join us. Hopefully, Paul Schlafly of Riverside Charters checks in from Manistee. His cell is very tenuous. We may not get to talk to him. In hour number two, Brad Dupuis, Mr. Angler Quest. Then Corporal Jill Miller talking about uh, big water boating safety. And in our third hour, Richard P. Smith on a bear attack in the UP on a, uh, on a trout fisherman and, of course, wild game chef extraordinaire Dave Miner. That's all coming up this week right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in St. Joe on WSJM 94.9 FM. You can hear us in Lansing on WILS 1320 AM. And north of the bridge in Marquette, WDMJ 1320 AM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by the Linwood Beach Marina and Campground. Linwood Beach can be your year-round Saginaw Bay fishing destination and your Mid-Michigan Tracker and Angler Quest headquarters. Coming up on the 23rd of July this month, uh, Linwood Beach will be the scene of the first annual Angler Quest Owners Tournament. More details on that at the website anglerquestpontoons.com. And if you want to learn more about Linwood Beach, check out their uh, website, linwoodbeachmarina.com. That's linwoodbeachmarina.com. Great location, great people, great launch, great facilities, great campground. A uh, great uh, 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 shop. I can't say enough about Linwood Beach. Again, linwoodbeachmarina.com. All right, so I told you before the break that uh, I did get my Michigan bear tag for the third season in Newberry, and I will be hunting there in September, the end of September, with Johnny Bowler. Before then, though, I have another wonderful hunt that I'm looking forward to. And if you didn't, if you didn't, get your Michigan bear tag, there is still an option for you. You can go north of the border, you can go to Ontario, and you can get a tag over the counter. That is something I have done for the last, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 years, whatever it is now. I love going to White River. The scenery is outstanding. It's beautiful. There are lots of bears. You may see a wolf. You may see a moose, and you will see bears. But the thing that I really love most about White River is the people there. You know, you might have heard, heard uh, horror stories about going north of the border and the, the people not being very friendly to Americans and kind of standoffish. Well, you won't find that in White River. Uh, the people there become your friends. Everybody who's gone up there with me over the years says, man, the people are great, and they've maintained these relationships, these friendships. Ron St. Louis is one of those guys. He is the owner of Northern Wilderness Bear Outfitters. And he's the guy that I will be hunting with in the middle of August, and he's with us now on the Outdoor Magazine phone line. Ron, welcome back to the show. How have you been? Good, good, Mike. How have you been? I've been doing real good. Listen, so how did, you, how did your spring hunt? Well, first of all, let's back up a step. You had to take a while off because of COVID, but you're back up and running now. How are things going? Yeah, going good. I mean, it, it was, you know, 
slowly getting fired back up, you know, with the borders still not opened up 100%, uh, you know, to non-vaccinated uh, individuals. But, I mean, you know, we are back in operation, so it's slowly picking up. Uh, you know, we're back into it, full swing, you know, the baits. Baits are going, you know, going good and everything, so it's just, you know, we're back into it now. Well, and that's the thing. You do have to be vaccinated, and there's an app that you download to your phone that you have to jump through some hoops, but it's not that big a deal, and you can get back across the border, and you had hunters this spring. How did that hunt go? Uh, the hunt went uh, really well. Like, I mean, uh, we had uh, 15 hunters. I said everybody, uh, 13 bears harvested some good bears. Um, you know, two fellows, you know, they, they had their opportunity. Uh, you know, at harvesting a bear, you know, took the shot, you know, like uh, it happens, you know, where the animal's not recovered. But, I mean, you know, the opportunity was there, but lots of bears, lots of bears on camera, good-sized bears. Um, you know, Nick Grillo was with us. He shot a beautiful uh, color phase bear. So, And there was lots of, uh, I think there was four or five different color phase bears seen on, like, had pictures on uh, the cameras and stuff. So it was good. Lots of bears. And, and that color phase, that's something we haven't seen a lot of with you guys until at least recently. Yeah, it's, it's the last few years. Like We had some some good-sized boars in the area that, uh, you know, color phase boars. So, I mean, you know, the breeding is there. So, um, you know, the opportunity of, of, you know, getting a bear, it's there. It's just uh, a matter of if they walk in on the bait when, you know, <laughs> yeah. when the hunter's there. And didn't Nick put a real nice video together of that hunt? I think it showed off your area very well and showed off your operation very well. Yeah, no, he did an excellent job, excellent job. And, uh, you know, he harvested a nice bear. Um, he had a dandy bear on uh, on camera. Like, if you see his uh, his video that he put together, it's it's just, uh, it's amazing. Like, he had an excellent time. Um, and it was great having, you know, having everybody back. Last fall, we had a quick hunt. Like, you know, I mean, you were there, and then it was just put together quick, you know, but this year, we're, you know, like I'm firing up the beats uh, this weekend, so so I got a well, head start. You know, I always do that in case that the berries come in or whatever, then, you know, we're ahead of the game, so. Yeah, we call it a fall hunt. It's, uh, you know, it's it, it, it's really, it's a it's a late summer. It's a mid-August. The season opens up August 15th, and, and that is traditionally your big hunt, right? You'll have a lot more hunters in camp for that one. Yep. Yeah. Like it's, uh, it's, it's a lot bigger than the spring. I mean, uh, with the spring hunt coming in, you know, like it, I'm trying to, to, you know, take on 20 guys, 25 guys in the spring and, and you know, in the fall, um, you know, 30, 35, 40 guys. It's just in the past, we didn't have a spring hunt. So we, you know, we were running a few more guys in the fall, but now with the spring hunt, a lot of guys prefer to do the spring hunt. Uh, you know, it kind of breaks it up and gives us a break at the same time. So, because it is a lot of work. Oh yeah, and and you know, in the in the spring hunt, you got some advantages. You don't have to worry about the berry crop. The bears are going to be hungry, which in yeah. the in the fall hunt, in the August hunt, sometimes Mother Nature works against us. It does. I mean, it works against us. But the way I look at it is, if you put the time and you put more bait out, and you just stay consistent on it. And, you know, the, the bears, once you get the bears on the baits, they're always going to come back to those baits. I said, so if you just, you know, don't skip a beat, stay on top of it, they're going to come in. You know, and if you have a, you know, you have a year where you got a lot of berries and you got good bears coming in, that's that's when you don't, you know, you don't wait. If you, you don't hesitate. If you got a decent bear that comes in, a good shooter bear, you know, you might have to take them on that first day or second day because you might not see them again or so it, it's, it's the only difference where it makes it tough is if you have a good berry crop. But we've always done good in the past. Like always, whether the berries were there, we've always, you know, did really well. So, hey, Well, and it's a first-class operation, Ron. I always say this. People, you know, I, I don't hesitate to recommend you and your son Gibby and, and the operation there in White River. And you have built this into one of Ontario's biggest bear hunting operations right yeah we did you know, we started off you know with small and then you know when i first started off i only had three hunters the first year you know and then it's fully <laughs> you know building up you know clientele and then trying to it, just trying to get people promoted like and I, you know i was new at it and I, well i worked you know with pete jones and stuff like that guided for him 
And then once I took over his operation, everything, it kind of just, everybody kind of knew me. So, you know, and, and I like to run a, you know, good operation. So, and it's just, it's, it's been amazing. You know, great people, they're like family, you know, uh, they come up every year. It's, it's just, you know, we just, we just want to make sure when everybody comes here, they have a great experience and they want to come back. You know what I mean? It's, it's not just about the bear hunt. It's about everybody being here, you know, uh, like being together. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's to the point almost where the, the, the bear, the hunt itself, the harvest itself almost is secondary. It's coming up and it's seeing you guys and it's shooting the breeze and it's joking around and it's tracking bears and it's helping to bait. It's just, it, what what is the key then in your mind to putting together a successful bear hunting operation like you guys have done? I think the key is just it's hard work. It's hard work, and then listening, listening to the hunters when they come in. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, what's going on? Like, what are you seeing? Like, like maybe you change this up a little bit, and um, and every year, you know what I mean? You you, you might want to change a few things, uh, uh, and just it's spending the time, you know. Having chatting with the hunters, everybody getting together at the end of the night, you know, sharing stories. Um, like I say, it's not just about, you know, harvesting the bear. Like, uh, you know, our success rates, you know, really, really good. Like, uh, you know, um, and it's the hard work. You know, we just, like, like I say, I put in the hard work, I put in the time. You know, I mean, if it gets to a point where, you know, I'm, I'm slacking off or, I, you know, I, I start to lose interest, then, you know, uh, I just, you know, I don't want to get, I never want to be there. You know what I mean? I want to make sure when everybody gets here, they have an excellent time. They, they go home and they say, you know what? I went to White River. It was great. You know, do you want to go next year? Well, and, and the answer is almost always yes. Yes, let's go yeah, back. Yeah. How many different baits are you running, Ron? Uh, in the spring, the spring we had, what, 15 guys. I was running 45 baits. The fall I'll be running a bit more. I'll be running close to 100 baits. Wow. So, yeah. And how far back into the bush away from town are these baits set up? Uh, I got them as far as 35, 40 miles. And why do you pick the bait sites that you do? I mean, you got you got hundreds of thousands of acres of crown land you could be on. How do you know where to put a bait? Uh, it just, you know, we're picking a bait. We go, we check out the areas. We look for bear activity um, in the areas um, markings on the trees, uh, close to ponds. And a lot of these bait sites have been established for years, like, you know, from previous owners that, you know, 35, 35, 40 years. So, you know, those bears are used to those bait sites. Um, and a lot of the bait sites that I, you know, we went around, uh, I went around for a ride, you know, with, uh, with Daryl, my buddy Daryl, and we went and checked out old sites that I haven't hunted in, uh, you know, probably 13, 14 years. And, and, I would, you wouldn't believe it. In the spring, the bear activity was there. Really? They were walking in and out of those baits. So <laughs> they know they're there. It's just a matter of, you know, like picking them back up and then firing them back up. What do you use so. for bait, Ron? That's that's the $64,000 question. People saw, always say, you know, what's the best bear bait? And and with you, I've noticed it, sometimes it varies from year to year, I think, depending on actually what you can get your hands on. Yeah, it varies. Like, I stick with a lot of sweets, uh Grease is a ticket, you know, t- grease is a big ticket, you know, firing up baits and using grease all the time. Um, we use a lot of, you know, granolas, cereals, uh, jams, uh, caramel. Uh, you know, I've been using this new bait out of Thunder Bay where it's uh, it's got oats in it, you know, uh, seeds, sunflower seeds. It's got um, corn, and it's got a mixture of some sweets in with it, uh, and it works great. You know, it's just... I mix it up with everything, so that way there the, the bears have a variety, and most of the time they just they hit it. And once they hit it, they start cleaning it out, and it works. You know, what I mean, you got to try what works, and if you see something that's not working or they're not, you know, um, you know, they're not really eating all of it, then I just I don't use it. Hang tight, Ron. Hang tight. i got to take a break. We're talking to Ron St. Louis of Northern Wilderness Bear Outfitters. The website, northernwildernessbearoutfitters.com, northernwildernessbearoutfitters.com. If you didn't get a Michigan bear tag, hey, or even if you did, and you want to go on a bear hunt in Ontario, in my mind, Ron is your guy. we got to take a break. When we come back, we'll find out what kind of openings he has in White River after the break right here on Outdoor Magazine. (music) 
Welcome back to the Outdoor Magazine Show. My name is Mike Avery. You can hear the show in Alpena on WZTK. That's 105.7 FM. You can hear us in Flint on Sports Extra 1330 WTRX and north of the bridge in Iron Mountain, WMIQ 1450 AM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by Rapid River Knife Works. I have a Rapid River Knife in my pocket right now, and I will have it in my pocket as I go north of the border to hunt with Ron St. Louis of Northern Wilderness Bear Outfitters. If you want to learn more about Rapid River, check out the website rapidriverknifeworks.us, rapidriverknifeworks.us. Folding knives, what we used to call jack knives, skinning knives, caping knives, and it really isn't that the same thing, fillet knives, ch- uh, kitchen knives, Axes, hatchets, all handmade by craftsmen in Michigan's UP. Again, the website, rapidriverknifeworks.us. Okay, if you didn't get your Michigan bear tag, or as I said before the break, even if you did and you're a hardcore, avid bear hunter like I am and you want to do two hunts this fall, I have a suggestion. Go to White River and hunt with Ron St. Louis of Northern Wilderness Bear Outfitters. I know if you haven't done this before, it can be intimidating, a little scary even. You're a little nervous, right? Is this a good operation? Is this somebody I want to hunt with? But here's the good thing. I have hunted White River with Ron St. Louis for many years. I will personally vouch for him and his operation, and I'm going to be up there in mid-August myself. We're talking with Ron St. Louis right now. He's on the Outdoor Magazine phone line. Ron, I I guess before I start pushing this too hard, do you have openings for the August hunt? Yes, I do. I I have a few. I got a few openings, so if if they're interested, just, uh, you know, give us a call right away. Um, I do have some spots open, uh, so it just, you know, don't hesitate. Just give us a call so, uh, so they don't miss out on a spot. All right, and that phone number is on the website, northernwildernessbeeroutfitters.com, or if people want to send me an email to mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com, I can put them in touch with you, Ron, as well. So what yeah. should somebody expect from a hunt with you? Is it a guaranteed harvest? I mean, if they guaranteed, you're going to see bears. You know what I mean? Like, we, we go out of our way to make sure, you know, we do our best to make sure we put you on a bear. You know, whether it's moving you to a different bait, um, you know, we, we go out of our way. I mean, and most of the people that come here, you know, they see a bear, they have an opportunity to shoot the bear, whether they they choose to or not. Like, we work hard to make sure, you know, that you're going to have success and, you know, you have an excellent time. And, and I guess that's the point I was trying to make is there is there is no guarantee. This is, a, this, is, this is a hunt. It's not a kill. It's not a harvest. It's a hunt. You're after wild animals. There's a lot of territory up there. There's a lot of bush up there. And there have been times, Ron, when I, I've i seen bear and just decided it wasn't a bear I wanted to take. So, uh, but, but what you're saying is, and again, there is no guarantee, but your odds are very, very good of getting a shot at a bear, and then the rest is up to you as the hunter. Yes, yeah, that's, that's correct. I mean, we go, you know, like... The best we can do is guarantee that we're doing our job, you know what I mean? And, and you know, we're working hard. Like, it, you know, we got to make sure we work the hardest we can. And, and so when, you know, when the individuals get here, the hunters get here, you know, their success rate is going to be, you know, really good, really high, because we put the effort in to make sure that it happens. You've got two baits set aside for every hunter if for some reason those baits went dead. And if they did, you wouldn't be putting a hunter out there. But if for some reason they did, you got backup baits that you can move people to. Um, the goal is to put people on bears. Yeah, yeah, that's our goal. I mean, if, uh, you know, and it does happen. You, you might, last minute, if the berries come in or whatever, you might have one bait that are a few baits that's, you know, they just turned off for a day or two or whatever. So, you're not going to sit somebody there, take them, put them in a different bait where you know that bait's still, you know, it's rocking. You know what I mean? But, you know, the rule of thumb is just if you sit on that bait for three days, put the time, the effort in, chances are you're probably, the bear is going to come in. You know what I mean? But if you start jumping around, I tell guys don't jump around because, you know, chances are you're going to move on that day. If you got a good bear there, you're going to move to a different bait, and that bear is going to come in and you're not sitting there. And that's always that's always the question, isn't it? And it's kind of a mind game. And I guess, 
I guess yeah. what I've done is is I just I got two baits, yeah. but I pick a bait and I sit on it because if you put your time in, like you say, a shooter animal and the shooter is different for different people is probably going to come in. Yeah, yeah. So it's just to put the time in. You know, I like I I, I tell the you know I tell the guys you know just you know uh, just don't jump around. You know what I mean? Listen to us. Just. You know, if I, if, if I say, you know, a lot of times the guys will say, you know what, should I move? Should I move? I say, give it one more night. You know what I mean? I wouldn't move. And all of a sudden, boom, they shoot, you know, they shoot their bear. <laughs> they shoot a good bear because they said, you know what, you're right. I said, because we know how the baits, the way our pattern is, like we skip a day in between. So those those baits you bait, skip a day, you bait. So, and if they're hit constantly, you know, if you sit there, he's going to come back. You know, that's just a matter of. It might be an extra day, but they're going to hit it, you know, within that timeline. So Because I've hunted with you enough, buddy, and I'm on to you, I know you're going to say that. Should I move? No. You're going to say, give it another day. I don't care if it's the first day or the fourth day. You're going to say, give it another day. I get it. And it almost yeah. always works out. Listen, Ron, i got to go. I'll let you get on with your day. And uh, we'll talk again soon. The website, northernwildernessbearoutfitters.com, northernwildernessbearoutfitters.com. Ron St. Louis' contact info is on that site. Or send me an email to Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. I can make that connection for you. Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. I will be up there hunting with Ron August 15th. If you want to join us, there are openings. NorthernWildernessBearOutfitters.com. Send me an email to Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. After the break, a Lake Michigan salmon fishing report here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Muskegon on WKBZ. That's 1090 a.m. Over in Port here on WPHM, 1380 a.m. And then north of the bridge in Newberry, WNBY, 1450 a.m. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by MUCC's On the Ground program. OTG is a program to improve habitat for fish and wildlife across the state. How can you possibly, what can possibly be wrong with that, right? Nothing, nothing at all. Check out the uh, website, MUCC.org, for more details on that. And just a reminder, if you want to save 25% on signing up to become an MUCC member, use the promo code MIKE, all caps M-I-K-E, and save 25% at that website, MUCC.org. While you're online, check out my website, Mike Avery Outdoors. Then jump on over to RiversideCharters.com. RiversideCharters.com, the website of one of uh, Lake Michigan's uh, most experienced and best-known charter captains. His name is Paul Schlafly. He's on the water right now. I'm not sure on his cell pat. Let's see how he sounds. Paul, welcome back to the show. How are you? I'm doing good, and I got a big tangle here right now. I'm fighting a fish. <laughs> He's going through all my wires, trying to well, get them through it. The good news is the cell signal sounds good, but you got yeah. you got your hands full. Well, you know, it seems like if I troll in south, I have no service. If I go troll north, I got good service. <laughs> so I don't get it, but, uh, but, but we you got a fish on here. He's going through my wires on my divers, but I think we got him out of them. So. You got a, you got a, you got a mate today, Paul. You're doing it single handed. I got a mate today. Yeah, I, I run a mate. You just more. about this you just, time of year I run a mate more. Well, you just about have to, don't you? Going on. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's. Just, I mean, you know, I can do it without a mate, but just the older I get, it's easier with a mate. So. <laughs> I can relate to that. <laughs> yeah. So how well, is so how is the salmon fishing setting up for the summer, Paul? It's been really good. We've been catching them since the middle of May. They've been here, you know, throughout the whole so far all summer so it's looking good you know there's a lot of bait fish the lake is just loaded with bait i mean just big alewife small alewife fish are fat i mean there's some nice size kings being caught we got we got one probably pushing 28 pounds today wow so there's some nice fish i think there's gonna be a lot of 30 pounders caught this year and this fish this fish you got on right now good fish it's a lake trout we're kind of just start fishing lake trout here salmon shut down so we're just Coming in here and fishing a few few trout. It's getting some nice lakers. Really good size ones. I had one 19 pounds yesterday. So wow. Some big ones around. Yeah. A lot of big fish. 
I got a lot of food this year to eat, so that's a good thing. Well, yeah, it is a good thing. And this whole concept yeah. of seeing alewives again, actually having a little bit of an alewife die off. I mean, who would have thought a few years ago? I know. That's DNR was really worried about it. Think, thankfully, it's uh, you know materializing. You know, the alewife population is coming back good, so it's definitely a really good thing for us. So, what's the hot Fresh. ticket right now? The hot give give us give us a tip for somebody heading to. Uh, to Manistee, where you are, or any of the ports there, where, where would they start? I'm not looking for your honey hole, but it's just some generic tips. I mean, it seems like we're catching them all the way on to Point Sabo, but, of course, I try to go as close as possible with this fuel cost. You yeah, know? buddy. I just been mostly fishing out front just because of that, but there's fish there, and we go to the south, there's fish. Today, most of my salmon came today in, like, 200 foot of water and, um, this morning, but anywhere it seems like from 120 to 200s we've been catching them you know and and i've even heard guys catching steelhead all deeper but i you know you know it's like you know 10 miles out so i haven't been out there but we you know catching good numbers of salmon and lake trout mix inside and we'll catch an occasional steelhead in here you still got but, that uh, fish on or did you get it in the boat just got it in a boat just got them in <laughs> wonderful he was causing problems <laughs> <laughs> But, so, but so yeah. in general, this time of year, then the, the 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 ticket is get out there real early and fish salmon first thing in the morning. That's pretty much how you know my program is. I'll fish them for probably to about eight o'clock or so, and then if the, if I quit catching them, I just a lot of lake trout. So we go in there. And if the guys want lake trout. We'll go in there and fish them, and usually I get a bunch of them. I've been limiting out on them pretty much every trip. So. Depending on the people I got. Yeah, and and I mean the, these lake trout today, there's nothing wrong with them, right? I mean, the old days they were greasers and slime balls, but not so much these days. Yeah, they're, they're, they, you know, I think it's a different strain. They're putting you know, fish are better eaten than years ago, and the meat's even a lot different colored, a lot oranger meat. And so yeah, it's, they're definitely good eating. You running yeah, double? You running doubles yet, Paul? You running two a days yet? Yeah, yeah, I've been. Yep. Not every day, but like I got next four, three days I got to run doubles, and I got another captain to help me run the boat too now, so that works out good. What's uh, your uh, before I let you go? What's your schedule look like? Sounds like the fishing's pretty good. Can you take uh, clients right now, or are you looking at midweek only? I'm pretty well. All my mornings are all booked. The only thing I got pretty much, unless I get a cancellation, is afternoons. Um, if somebody does call me, I can set them up with a boat. You know, there's plenty of good charters right, you know, right in our marina. So, and you know, and elsewhere too. But if somebody's looking for a trip, I, my wife can usually set them up with somebody. Sounds good, Paul. I'll yeah, let, I'll let you listen. I'll let you get back to fishing. I'll send people to the website riversidecharters.com, riversidecharters.com. From there, you can get in touch with Captain Paul Schlafly. If he's got an opening, I would encourage you to jump on with him. If he's booked up, he can set you up with another top quality captain. Paul doesn't work with anybody who's not top shelf. So if Paul uh, s- sends you somewhere, you can be assured it's going to be a good trip. Riversidecharters.com, riversidecharters.com. Great to hear the salmon fishery is doing well. Great to hear there's a lot of bait fish out there. Alewife day- die off. Who would have thought about that? Uh, we'll take a break for the top of the hour. When we come back at hour number two, Mr. Angler Quest himself, Brad Dupuy, here on Outdoor Magazine. Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Mike Avery has covered the outdoors in Michigan for more than four decades, and that tradition continues today. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Jay Sporting Goods, the Eider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons and Polar Craft Boats, the Forward Corporation, Primal Tree Stands, Security Credit Union, Garber Chevrolet, Brenton USA Hunting Rifles, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Well, thank you, Ken Hunter, uh, for that introduction, and welcome to our number two of this week's Outdoor Magazine radio show here on the Outdoor Magazine radio network, heard on more than, more than 30 radio stations across the great state of Michigan. I say radio. You, know, you don't care. I get it. Um, 
but I, I kind of do. To me, it's an important distinction that this is, first and foremost, a radio show. Outdoor Magazine Radio is programmed, recorded, syndicated, distributed as a radio show. And I think the best way to listen, if you can, is on your local radio station. Uh, the, the broadcast stations get the content before the podcast version is made available. So again, I recommend listening on your local radio station if you can. But if you live in some part of our state not covered by the broadcast signal, or if your local affiliate doesn't carry all three hours, yes, this is a three-hour show, isn't it nice to know that there is a podcast version available as a backup? Now, where do you hear that podcast? Well, I put it on the website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. It's on my Facebook page. It's on Amazon Music. It's on Audible. It's on Twitter, uh, Google Play, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Anywhere you get a podcast from, you can hear the podcast version of the Outdoor Magazine radio show, even on YouTube. Yeah, I put a version on YouTube. Um, Speaking of podcasts, I do a monthly podcast for uh, several of the companies I work with, including Offshore Tackle. And today when we're done, we're going to do an Offshore Tackle podcast. Next week, I will record an Angler Quest podcast. The week after that... Uh, a Primal Tree Stands podcast, and the week after that, a Polar Craft Boats podcast. So I would encourage you to check those out as well. Oh, so what's going on right now this time of year? Well, you know if you're going to be bear hunting in Michigan now. You know if you're going to be elk hunting in Michigan. I will not be elk hunting. I will be bear hunting. But before then, as I was saying in the first hour, I've got some fishing to do. I love Saginaw Bay walleye. It's a It's a resource that I have been involved in since the 80s when they brought the fish back. I I love chasing these fish. Um, The last few years, especially because I've partnered up with a Michigan-based company called Angler Quest Boats. You know about Angler Quest. I've been talking about them for years now. And they have become the premier fishing pontoon in this country. I'll make that statement right now. Other companies have tried to to copy Angler Quest and they haven't done a very good job. One of the reasons Angler Quest has become so successful in my opinion is the people behind it. Brad Dupuy, who I call Mr. Angler Quest, and and he's the first guy to say, "Look, at there are a lot of people responsible for Angler Quest success." And I get that. But Brad Dupuy is a hardcore angler who kind of designed this first angler quest, and he has improved and evolved this design ever since. He's a busy guy, but I managed to snag a few minutes here on the Outdoor Magazine phone line, and he's with us now. Brad, welcome back. How you doing? Hey, we're doing great, Mike. Um, we were in the core of the walleye season, and we're talking angler quest, a couple of great subjects, so I'm, I'm happy to be here. Man, we are right in the heat of it, right in the heart of it now, aren't we, Brad? Yeah, we really are. I tell you, it's been a strong year, and for me, I'm just seeing that deeper water bite kind of set up here in the last uh, week and a half or so. Um, it's been crazy how shallow a lot of our fish are, uh, but boy, last weekend, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday was fantastic fishing for me, so very excited to do it and very excited to talk about it mike well and i know you love that that deeper water fishery me i'm a shallow water guy i'm a skinny water guy i love chasing those fish up in 10 feet of water or less and that fishery is surprisingly strong now too now i do expect that any time now those fish are going to be gone i'm going to have to join you in deep water but i'll chase those skinny water fish as long as i can brad hey i don't blame you that's uh a great area to target them. I think the lack of rain this year and the lack of runoff hitting Saginaw Bay has really maintained that close to shore fishery. Um, It's exciting because it's a lot of years where we're off one and two and beyond looking for fish. This year, it appears as though they're just settling up into that deeper water. So I think we got some really good fishing coming in the next few weeks in, in the inner bay. 
one of the reasons I like those shallow water fish, the skinny fish, is to me they're easy to target. When they're in there close, they're in there because they're feeding, they're aggressive. I know where they're going to be. I mean, I got them limited to 10 feet of water, right? So they're easy to find. When you get out deeper, like 20, 25, 27, 30 feet of water right, where, where you like to fish, Brad, I start to lose my confidence because I don't know how to, how to approach those deeper fish. Help me out. How do you set up on those deep fish? Well, for me, the key to the deeper water is figuring out what part of the water column the fish are actively feeding in. And it's really, really easy to become complacent. All of a sudden, 45 back on 30 jets, you're taking fish and they go dead, you know. The fish continually move up and down throughout the whole day, depending on the day, depending on the weather. Um, I myself do a fair amount of fishing by myself, so it takes me a little more time to adjust to figure out the level where the fish are but i'll tell you the last few years one thing and i think this has always been the case but those bottom fish are always fish that are there and there are always active walleye on the bottom so for me i just try to put out a spread and you know target the different depths trying to cover different water figure out that active area and then once you do just keep moving it's nice to have nine or 12 rods out to just comb that water column vertically. So for me, um, it's a matter of figuring out where that active depth is. I believe, you know, clear conditions versus cloudy, choppy conditions, uh, I think all make a difference. I love using purples on the bottom. Uh, I prefer brighter chrome, uh, copperish type stuff up higher. Um, And, you know, one thing I don't do a very good job of, and I was talking to Jason over at Linwood about this yesterday, is I should be using my side scan way more than what I am. Uh, A lot of those side fish, you can really target what's to the side of you and those higher fish by using that tool. Um, I myself, I got to get a little more acclimated to using that more. But for me, it's a matter of trying to find that active area. I like hitting structure points that I've fished in the past. I believe fish, as they migrate out of Saginaw Bay, like to hang up on certain little elements of structure for a while. Um, The ones I was catching last week, I was having a lot of them throwing up uh, bigger minnows. Um, They're definitely on some bait out there. And as they move out, uh, I believe they like to hang up on structure and it'll keep them there for a little bit amount of time if we have consistent weather. So uh, combing that water column vertically is the key. And Figuring out the active zone is what it takes, Mike. Well, I'm with you, <clears throat> excuse me, on the side scan. That's a, that's an area that I really, uh, I, I, I don't use, you know, Lance, our mutual friend Lance Valentine's been on me, Avery. Keep an eye on your side scan. I, 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 I need to, but when you're getting fish, it's like, okay, I'm going to concentrate on catching these fish right now. I don't want to worry about some technology that I need to figure out. Right. Right, and where you're fishing in the shallower stuff, you know they're there. They're there or they aren't. You're running your crankbaits, you're yep. covering that smaller vertical part of the water column, and you're figuring out whether they're there or not by running baits. And you are hitting areas that you traditionally have hit in the past. you got a good feel for where those fish are. And, man, you've been getting some beauties in there shallow too, Mike. I have been some really nice fish, and isn't that nice to see on Saginaw Bay? You know, last summer there was a lot of these fish, the 13 inches that we had to measure. Are they legal or not? the The size of the fish on the bay this summer is really quite impressive. I agree. Definitely seeing some nicer fish every year. The past few years, it seems like they climb uh, a little larger in size. Nice to see. Uh, not anything like what it used to be in the 90s per se early 2000s, but it's still very, very nice to see those fish get bigger and good numbers of them, so it's awesome to see. I'll tell you what else is awesome to see, Brad, as I as I spend time on Saginaw Bay, especially out there at Linwood Beach, Angler Quest pontoons are everywhere now. You know, a, a, a few years ago, you know, there were a few and far between, and, and, and now wherever I look, I, wherever I'm fishing, if I look around and there are other boats, I will see an Angler Quest. Yes, that is very exciting. I I agree with you. It's really super cool to see. Uh, There's got to be 35 of them in Linwood Beach Marina docked up there. Um, There is a slew of them, and I'm with you. Uh, I'm out trolling along, and it is very common to see an angler quest either trolling by or motoring by, and 
pretty cool to see and really neat to see and it makes makes me proud uh, of our whole team and yourself and everybody involved uh, with angler quest yeah that's got to be rewarding for you mr angler quest are you comfortable with that brad or does it make you do you would you prefer i don't call you that <laughs> No, I, I don't mind it. Um, I'm not a person <laughs> that is glory oriented, so um, you, you probably hear me cringe a little bit when you say that. <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, I, I'm one person that uh, has a particular niche that I do what I do, and like like I've said in the past, you know, there's a whole team of people helping me and working with me to help accomplish uh, what we're doing. Um, it's it's been a tough year this year, just. We're just way behind. Hang tight, Brad. I want, I, well, I do want to talk more about that, but I, I got to yeah. take a break. We're talking with Brad Dupuis, Mr. Angler Quest, the website Angler Quest Pontoons, and Quest is Q-W-E-S-T. Angler Quest Pontoons, lots to talk about, including a big Angler Quest owners tournament coming up. That's after the break right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Battle Creek on WBCK 95.3 FM. You can hear us in Cairo on two stations, WKYO 1360 AM and WIDL 92.1 FM. And you can hear us in Sheboygan on Big Country Gold, WCBY 1240 AM and 100.7 FM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Michigan-based Boning Archery. Boning has been a leader in the archery industry since 1946. Think about that. They've been around for, what, 76 years now? They started out with feral tight. That was a product to uh, glue broadheads to, at the time, what were wood arrow shafts. These days, Boning continues to innovate, come up with new products, new manufacturing techniques, uh, they're really they're a leader in the archery industry, and they have been for three quarters of a century. Check them out online at boning.com. That's B-O-H-N-I-N-G, boning.com. Now, you compare Michigan-based boning, been around for 75, 76 years now, to Michigan-based Apex Marine, parent company of AnglerQuest. AnglerQuest, a, a fairly new company. I mean, they haven't been around that long. I remember when I f- saw the first prototype AnglerQuest at a, at a show in Freeland. At the time, it was sitting there by itself on the grass. I'd never seen one before, and I thought, you know what? This is interesting. This is a pontoon, but it looks like a fishing boat. It's a fishing pontoon. I, didn't even, I wasn't even aware of the concept yet at that time. When you look at what Angler Quest has done in the years since then, Brad Dupuy, Mr. Angler Quest, it's really very impressive what you guys have done. Well, I'll tell you, it's been a lot of work. Um, there's been a lot of evolution. The Saginaw Bay is a true testing ground. It is a rough body of water, and we've learned a lot over the years. And, you know, honestly, we keep evolving the product, trying to make it better trying to make it uh, uh, on the up and up as much as possible. So it's uh, definitely been a challenge. It's definitely been something that we've continually tried to improve and make better and better. And um, I believe we can see that in a product uh, going out the door these days. Well, I I think there's no doubt about it. This year, the, you know, six inches wider at, You know, at first I wasn't sure I could feel the extra width in the boat, but the more time I spend on it, I can indeed feel that. I love the cantilevered uh, fishing platform, meaning when you're out in the back of this thing, on this this extended transom, it's great for fishing. I mean, you're not hanging your lures up, and you can reach down right into the water and net fish. I think maybe a small thing, but a big improvement, Brad. Yeah, I agree. That is really cool to actually be standing over the water. Uh, I myself, as I mentioned earlier, fishing by myself a lot that I, I that I do, um, it makes, makes it a little easier for me to get that end out of the fish when I've got that cantilever off the back. And when I'm netting fish by myself, it makes it a little easier, a little more uh, nettable, per se. So uh, one of the many uh, things that we changed this year and a definite improvement for sure. 
Brad, you were talking before the break about some of the challenges of of any manufacturer these days, and and AnglerQuest is not immune to this. You do a lot in house, but for some things you got to go outside, and it hasn't been easy, has it? No, it's been very very tough. Um, uh, manufacturers on, are under allocation for raw materials, aluminum, uh, wood. Just a lot of things are hard to get uh, amongst all the componentry items that we're continually seeing shortages on. Um, we're seeing a little improvement on the stuff, but there's still a long ways to go. Uh, Pre-COVID, uh, compared to now, it is night and day difference, and it definitely holds us back. Uh, it's something that we're continually, you know, addressing. Um, we did a lot of commonization last year uh, of things, and we're continuing to really consolidate a lot of product this year for 2023 to help make things a little easier on purchasing um, and getting material goods. It has been a struggle. Um, we're still a ways. Of, uh, it's going to be tough sledding for a while, but it is something that we fight on a daily basis, Mike. You bring up the 23 models. Now, listen, I, you, you're, you're really good at holding secrets uh, <laughs> until it's time to, to unveil them. But I got to believe, Brad, because you did so many design changes and improvement improvements for 2022 combined with the fact that you've got some some challenges some uh, production challenges i don't expect to see a lot for 23 or am i being naive here no i I think you are correct in uh, stating that heck we're still trying to perfect our 22 uh, stuff that we're putting out Um, the bigger tubing a lot of the things that we did have definitely been a challenge to incorporate this year um, this is much stronger material. There's a lot of little uh, things that we're trying to tweak and improve. Um, I think the big thing that you're going to see for 2023 is more consolidating the offering to big, bigger product. Um, right now, a lot of us manufacturers are kind of in the mode that we only have a limited amount of production space, so we are not able to build is readily the smaller, lower revenue producing stuff. For us, it's important with our limited amount of boats that we can produce to try to concentrate on higher revenue product, uh, higher cost boats uh, as a whole, so that we can maintain our profit margins and revenue that we have coming in the door. So it's gonna be more about consolidation. Uh, Our engineering team has done a really awesome job on really consolidating walls and a lot of things that are going to help us, you know, be a little more streamlined than ever. So it's more about that kind of stuff. Like you said, we made a lot of changes last year. Heck, we're still getting caught up on those changes. Um, So uh, work to be had. It never stops. Uh, We're going to keep pushing. We're going to keep trying to improve. And, uh, you know, it's one day at a time and trying to get customers boats out. It's been, we're behind schedule. It's been a challenge, yeah. but uh, we're going to keep working. Well, and and, 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 I, and I get it, but even if you've got a boat ready to go, then you've got the challenge of getting a motor. And these big motors are not easy to find these days, are they? No, it's uh, been a huge issue. Heck, mercury on anything 200 or bigger is uh, a year to 60 weeks. Uh, Suzuki, wow. seven months. Honda's probably six months uh yamahas they're way 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 out there so um it takes a lot of planning and you know it's hard because you can't just go and stock tons of everything whether it's componentry whether it's motors you know us as a small business we're trying to keep cash flow at the right uh areas and the right right heights and try to keep things churning and uh you know, on motors to try to forecast all that stuff is very difficult, and you don't know. It could change where a year could be six months and a month. You just don't know. So it's been a challenge. Um, we're a little concerned, you know, just hearing all about the COVID stuff in China. I think, you know, I think we're a ways out from being a perfect world here yet, but uh, it just really goes to show as vertical as you can get, the better. So that's what we're going to continue to strive for. And we just got to keep hitting it day by day, Mike. What about the concept? And I, I hope I'm not talking out of school, and forgive me if I am, but if you, if, if these say the 300s, let's say a Merc, a 300 Merc is hard to get. 
What about hanging two 150s on each outside tube? Is that something that's been looked at? Is that would that work? Is that is that even something that would make sense? I think it absolutely would. Um, you know, that's a, you think about it, having to be able to bring the fish up right up the gut, you know, and work with everything in the center of their bowl would be pretty doggone nice. Uh, I've had a lot of people express a lot of interest in that, and it's something we're definitely looking at. It is a little longer-term project because there's a ton of engineering that needs to take place to, to do that. Um, with our engineering team that we're doing now, they really dig into stuff, and it takes longer to get stuff through, but it's also very well thought out and engineered. And that particular concept that you're referring to just will take a lot of time. Um, it's totally valid. Uh, it will you know, increase the cost of the bull because of dual gas tanks and different things that you may need to do to accommodate it. Um, but certainly a viable concept, especially when you start talking um, intercoastal areas. Mm, uh, those yeah, guys yeah. always want to have a couple motors uh, just for peace of mind. So it does definitely make something on the radar for sure, Mike. Hey, listen, before we let you go, let's change direction here a little bit. You've got an event coming up. It's uh, July 23rd. It's going to be based out of Linwood Beach Marina. And it's the first, what I think is going to be an annual event, Angler Quest Owners Walleye Tournament. Tell me more about that. Yeah, it's uh, something that, you know, uh, Kristen and marketing really, uh, her and I talked about it a lot over the past months. Uh, we're a little late at getting it organized for this year, but we absolutely are going to do this every year. Uh, we just think it will be a really cool event. It's more of a fun tournament, not necessarily a big dollar tournament. It doesn't cost anything to enter other than to be at the rules uh, in the early morning. Um, you know, it's a $1,000 uh prize payout for the heaviest five fish and i believe there's a 500 hundred dollar prize for the biggest fish so you know it, it's not a hardcore tournament necessarily we're going to be leaving the dock at eight coming back at noon you know and just a really fun event and uh look forward to you know doing that uh, i think it'll be really cool to have you know, it's really neat to see all the Angler Quest in Linwood Beach Marina. To have more of them all in one place, I think, will just be really super cool. So, we're looking forward to it. It's going to be a fun event. Um, it's something that um, will really be neat to get everybody together and, and fish and have a good time and, uh, you know, uh, develop some camaraderie with everybody. Uh, maybe somebody win a little money, a little competitiveness there. And uh, to have all the boats in one place, I think it would be a really, really super cool thing. Mike. Yeah, I do, too. I'm looking forward to it. I've actually got a crew put together. We're going we're gonna to fish it, and then um, I'm going to be involved in helping to, to MC the whole thing, too. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. That's Saturday, uh, July 23rd. It'll be based out of Linwood Beach Marina, our friends at Linwood Beach. And the details, the sign-up on this, uh, at the website, anglerquestpontoons.com. That's anglerquestpontoons.com. That's also the website where you can learn all about this Michigan-made uh, uh, pontoon fishing machine that has become so hot. And Brad Dupuis, you're a big reason for that. I give you uh, much credit for that. i got to let you go, but I look forward to seeing you on the water, and I wish you luck out there as well, my friend. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that, and I appreciate all your help and the best of luck to yourself in that shallow water. And then once we come deep, we'll work through it and we'll get them deep for you. When when it comes time to go deep, <laughs> Brad is one of the first guys I'm going to call. Brad Dupuis, Mr. Angler, uh, Angler Quest himself. The website, anglerquestpontoons.com, anglerquestpontoons.com. We'll take a break. When we come back, we're going to stay on the water, but we're going to talk with the DNR about big water boating safety. That's right here on Outdoor Magazine.
You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Tawas on WIOS 1480 AM, 106.9 FM, twice each weekend, by the way. Thank you. I appreciate that. You can hear us over on the other side of the state in Traverse City, WTCM 580 AM. Let's go north of the bridge. Let's go to Escanaba, the Riviera of the North. You can hear us on WCHT 600 AM, 95.3 FM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Brenton USA Hunting Rifles, AR-style, highly accurate, tough, and dependable hunting rifles that could change the way you hunt. They're made in Lansing. How cool is that? In fact, I have a three hundred and fifty Legend that I have not shot yet. I'm going to use it for my Michigan bear hunt. Uh, you can learn more, by the way, on the line, uh, online at BrentonUSA.com. That's BrentonUSA.com. I'm really looking forward to to using that rifle on my bear hunt and much more. But first, I've got some fishing to do. I've been out on Saginaw Bay chasing walleye out there, having a good summer, really enjoying it. But i got to be honest, um, even though I'm out there in a big, beautiful, dependable, safe angler quest, I keep an eye on the sky, I keep an eye on my gear, because if you spend enough time on the water, eventually something's going to happen. And when it goes south on the water, things go south in a hurry. Corporal Jill Miller from the DNR wants to talk more about that. Uh, Corporal, welcome to the show. How are you? Good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Listen, it's a real pleasure. It's nice to talk with you. So you are, if I, if I, like a statewide coordinator for, help me out, Jill, what is it? I am a marine specialist statewide. So I handle in UP, Lower Peninsula. That's where you'll find me. All right, so, um, well, uh, for example, on Saginaw Bay, we lost somebody a couple of weeks ago. That, that's a real tragedy. Can most of these be prevented, though, most of these accidents on the water? Yes, um, accidents happen, so you definitely need to be prepared. So life jackets are the main thing. Don't be too proud to wear a life jacket. That is what is going to save your life. Life jackets float. Unfortunately, people do not. Um, if, you know, a lot of these accidents could be prevented by people just wearing life jackets. I know we, we hear it life and it's, it's common sense, right? A life jacket can save your life, but they're, they tend to be big and orange and bulky. And that's a reason so we can spot them, but there are, there are alternatives out there these days. Yeah, they have those inflatable ones and, I mean, those are, yeah, you don't, when you're sitting on the boat, you know, anchored, you you don't need the life jacket. But when you're underway moving, um, a lot of the accidents happen when, you know, operators not paying attention, something, you know, you spot something in the water and swerve. It's not like driving a car. So there's no brakes on a boat. Um, Excessive speed could throw somebody over. So when you're sitting around, you know, shallow water, swimming, you know, you probably, you'd be okay. But if you're moving, I definitely recommend wearing that life jacket. Um, Also having a throwable, a type four, it's called a throwable, like one of those life rings or a seat cushion to throw some to somebody. The last thing you want is to try to search for that on the boat. It needs to be readily accessible. So we tell people keep that on, you know, the front of the boat under, you know, the steering column just let everybody know where that is on the back seat in a panic you want that that's going to fly and get to somebody a little bit better than throwing a life jacket to them so that's i mean another way to help somebody and if they're panicking they're not going to be thinking of anything except trying to stay above water so having those i guess life-saving things to use in case of an emergency are, are good things to, to have. But For sure. You talk life about jacket. life jackets, throwables. You talked about excessive speed. I, I got to believe alcohol is a factor too, right? And unlike a car, I mean, you can, you can op, you, you could drink a beer at the helm. You just can't operate intox, correct? That is correct. Yes. Alcohol use is the leading known contributing factor in fatal boating accidents. It just obviously, like driving a car, like you mentioned, it impairs your boat, the boater's judgment, balance, vision, reaction time. And especially if the water's a little bit colder, 
um, they're more susceptible to the effects of the cold water immersion. So you are legally allowed to have, I mean, drinks and boat, but you just can't be over that legal limit. But we definitely recommend if you're going out having a good time, make sure that the driver is sober. Just designate somebody to have that sober driver so everyone stays safe. Ren, real quick before I let you go, I, you know, I tend to think of big water boating safety, but the, the smaller inland lakes, you can get in trouble there too. Absolutely, yeah. When you go out, it's always good to have a float plan no matter where you go. Let somebody know where you're boating, um, the route that you plan to travel, how long you'll be gone, when you plan to return. Um, and, you know, check in with somebody. If you're gone, you know, a long time, be like, hey, we extended it. We're going to stay out a few more hours. You know, if we don't return, then they'll know, you know, something happens. Definitely have, you know, navigation, even a map. A lot of people need to read a map or have, you know, that navigation to kind of guide them where they're going, make sure phones are charged. I mean, just just try to be smart and safe about everything. Absolutely. Good advice. Uh, Great advice from Corporal Jill Miller. Uh, Corporal, appreciate your time. Uh, The website for the DNR, michigan.gov slash DNR, michigan.gov slash DNR. It's wonderful to be on the water. It's a great time. But again, when things happen, they can happen quick. And the, the last thing you want is to have something bad happen on the water. Michigan.gov slash DNR. This week's Ask Avery segment coming up after the break right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Houghton Lake on the Twister 92.1 WTWS. You can hear us in Manistee on WMLQ 97.7 FM. And you can hear us out in the Thumb on WMIC in Sandusky 660 AM and 95.3 FM. The Ask Avery segment is brought to you each week by my friends from Security Credit Union. Security Credit Union, one of the fastest growing credit unions in the state and for good reason, And they love to work with outdoors men and women. They can help you with your next outdoor adventure. Check them out online at securitycu.org. That's securitycu.org. The way the Ask Avery segment works is this is your chance to get involved in the content of the show, the programming of the show. You can send me a question you want me to answer directly, or you can uh, send me a question you'd like me to pass along to the DNR or MUCC or somebody like that. And the best way to get those questions to me is to send me an email, mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com. That's mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com. There are a lot of social media messaging platforms these days, and I've had people submit questions that way, and and sometimes I get them, sometimes I don't, but there's just so many out there, and they're so confusing. I strongly recommend, if you want to reach me, Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com, not only for the Ask Avery segment, but for just general comments, questions, and such as well. Now, the Ask Avery segment that I had planned for this week, and I hope to be able to follow up next week, and this is in response to the drawing results at the DNR's website for most recently bear and elk permits, the drawing uh, success, and also let's include turkey as well. Um, I want to find out how much the DNR makes on these application, on the application process. Is it a money-making effort? Do they actually say, say, for example, 50,000 people apply for an elk tag. You got, they got to make some money on this, right? Now, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with this, and I'm not saying the system is bad or or whatever. I'm, I'm not. I'm not ready to make that statement, and I doubt if I ever will be ready to make that statement. But by next week, I hope to be able to find out how much money is is made by the drawing process. But in the meantime, let me just follow up a little bit on a topic that was talked about last week. And this is when I was talking about um, going to the state high school trap shooting tournament the championship in mason 
and I talked about the fact that there were 1,100 kids there, every one of them with a gun. They fired more than 100,000 rounds, and not one problem, not one accident, not one incident, incidents of violence, anything like that. So I was using that as an example in my mind that guns are not a problem. It's the people who use the guns. And I, I made the statement to, to, to me, Mike Avery, this is just common sense. And I think it's the perfect example. So a lady from West Michigan sent me an email in response to this. And she sent the email to Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. And I, I won't use her name, but I give her much credit because she gave her name and she even gave me her phone number. And that's a very, very stand-up thing to do. Oftentimes when people disagree with me or chastise me or, or, or think I'm an idiot, they will not stand up and give their name and email uh, and phone number. And she did. And, of course, I have her email address too, so I, I won't give her name. But, again, that's a very stand-up thing to do. So she sent me an email. She said, don't brag about the number of kids at the trap shoot without an incident. We're not after their hunting rifles. She said, we hunt too. She said, I can't believe you tried to use that as support for a mental illness diagnosis over guns. It's the automatic weapons that you and your kind can't justify. My response is, the type of gun isn't the issue. A gun is a gun. It's a tool, nothing more. In every problem where a gun was used for violence, it was not the fault of the gun, but rather the person behind it. Her response is, I totally disagree. Take away the guns and you have a better chance against fists or even knives. She said, even you can see that. My response, by the way, is she talked about automatic weapons. She said, it's the automatic weapons that you and your kind can't justify. So I came back and said, by the way, it's illegal to own automatic weapons. Okay, automatic weapons. You pull a trigger once, you get multiple firing of the gun. That's an automatic weapon. It's, it's a machine gun. It's illegal for people uh, outside the military, or maybe police, I don't know what to use. But we as citizens can't, can't have those. Uh, I said, by the way, it's illegal to own automatic weapons. I strongly suggest you rethink your argument. And here's where she comes back and we wrap it up. She said, on what planet is it illegal to own automatic weapons? She said, I strongly suggest you get off your quest for manliness, which you can achieve in safer ways, and use some common sense. She had me to that point. We were having a good conversation, and then when she doesn't understand the difference between a semi-auto gun and an automatic gun, and she turns it from a good argument to I need guns, guns to justify my manliness. She lost me. And isn't that the case? Why can't we just have a good common sense discussion without taking it someplace else? Thank you to my friends at Security Credit Union for making each week's Ask Avery segment possible. Check them out online, securitycu.org, securitycu.org. We'll take a break for the top of the hour. Richard P. Smith joins us shortly. Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Mike Avery has covered the outdoors in Michigan for more than four decades, and that tradition continues today. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Jay Sporting Goods, the Eider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons and Polar Craft Boats, the Forward Corporation, Primal Tree Stands, Security Credit Union, Garber Chevrolet, Brenton USA Hunting Rifles, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Indeed, this is the big guy, Mike Avery, and welcome to our number three of this week's Outdoor Magazine show right here on the Outdoor Magazine radio network. More than 30 stations across the great state of Michigan. I'm here for three hours each week talking about the history and tradition of the outdoor lifestyle here in the great state of Michigan and occasionally beyond. We talk about hunting and fishing and shooting and trapping and wildlife issues and conservation issues. 
We even wrap up each week's show with uh, some wild game cooking. And we will do that once again. We'll wrap up uh, this third hour with uh, Chef Dave Miner. But in the meantime, I want to talk with a guy who is uh, uh, one of my favorite guests. He's a friend of mine. His name is Richard P. Smith. Now, we had Richard on, oh, not too long ago. But there's so many things going on in his world. And there's so many things that he is so knowledgeable of. And he's so well tuned in, especially to things in the UP, and a, a couple of things that we wanted to bring him back on to talk more about. And guess what? He has graciously agreed to talk with us once again, and he's on the end of our Outdoor Magazine phone line. Richard, welcome back. How are you? I'm great, Mike. How are you? I'm doing great. I noticed when Pat uh, Pat Johnson here, when he picked up the phone, he said he called you sir. What a sign of respect. Or maybe that's a sign of a deference to age. I, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but it's nice to be around the industry for a while, isn't it, Richard? Yes, it is. Uh, there's a lot of history and things that have happened that uh, a lot of people don't have. It, it does give you um, a perspective and an insight, and you are so good at um, at weaving these all together and keeping track of things. And, and, and I want to talk about this you know, a little bit later in our conversation, but first... Let's talk about bear hunting. I'm assuming you got your tag, or you will get your tag. You were successful in the drawing. That's correct. Were you? I was. I'll be back in the Newberry District in the third season. Congratulations. I'm so excited. I'll be hunting back there with my buddy Johnny Bowler. Um, and this year, Richard, I'm doing something different. Uh, you know I love, to, I love to bow hunt for bears, and I've mm-hmm. taken a lot of bears with a bow. This year... I'm going to use a Michigan-made rifle. I'm going to use a Brenton USA 350 Legend. Now, I realize that's not the ideal bear gun, but I think a 350 will do just fine on a bear, don't you? It will. Um, I, I was guiding a hunter two, three years ago that I believe used a 350 and dropped a bear in his tracks. Well, and, and, and let me ask you this question. Because I've never killed a bear with a gun... Where do I shoot him? Do I shoot him behind the shoulder like I would with a bow, or do I shoot him in the shoulder, or what? Well, uh, what what weight bullet is that three fifty shoot? Uh, 180, if I remember right. Okay. That's a, a stout enough bullet. You could actually shoot on a broadside bear, shoot it right on the shoulder, break the shoulder blade, increase the opportunity to drop the bear in its tracks. But it depends on what position that bear is when it gives you a shot. Mm-hmm. You know, um, my book, the second edition of Black Bear Hunting, has a series of photos that shows where to aim when bears are in different positions. Oh, I will look for that. I will look for that. And also, don't let me forget, we want to talk about the the, uh, great uh, Michigan deer tales, too, coming up. So we got a lot to talk about, as we always do, Richard. But first, let's talk about, there was an incident. Uh, Do we call it an incident? Do we call it an accident? I don't know. An an attack of a black bear on 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 an angler? Yes, most definitely. It's very rare. It uh, doesn't happen very often. And this is the first case I know of in the UP or anywhere in Michigan where a bear has attacked a fisherman to get the fish that he had. Uh, it happened on June 26th. Um, 82-year-old Louis Hodgela uh, was putting brook trout that he caught that morning in a Ziploc bag in his side-by-side, a bear came behind him, knocked him down, trying to get at the fish. And he actually fell and hit his head on a rock, suffering the most serious injury. He fractured a vertebrae in his uh, neck uh. after hitting the rock. The bear scratched his hand that he was holding the fish with to try and get at the fish. He was knocked unconscious when he hit the rock. Uh, when he came to, his right hand was bloody from claw marks uh, from the bear getting at the fish, and the fish were gone. That's crazy. I mean, I, I, I always tell people, oh, don't worry about black bears. They're, they're fine. They're not going to hurt you. What happened here? Well, I, I suspect it was a female with cubs that was nutritionally stressed, very hungry, uh, when a female is nursing cubs. It requires a lot of energy, and they lose weight during the process. Uh, it could be a first-time mother or an older female with multiple cubs, uh, two or three or four even. Um, and 
she was hungry. She smelled the fish and wanted the fish. It, it, she had to be very hungry if it was a female. Now, I, I'm speculating. We don't know for a fact. But females with cubs would be the most nutritionally stressed at this time of year. And um, it would she'd have to be really hungry to wow. a, 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 attack a person to get the fish. Now, uh, when, when you're fishing a stream in the UP, you've got to assume that there are bears around. But did, had he seen any bears? Did he know that there was a bear right there in the well, area? He, he had seen. I, I spoke to Lewis's daughter, Carissa Fisher, who lives in Arkansas. But be, after the attack, she came to the UP to help her father with his recovery. And she said that uh, her father had seen a small bear earlier in the day when he was fishing and didn't think much of it. And it's unclear if it's the same bear he saw that that it uh, grabbed the fish from him or not. Wow. But, you know, my I've had personal experience wading a trout stream in the UP where I'm very quiet. I had a, a female with cubs on the bank that smelled me, and she started raising a fuss when she knew I was so close. So I just turned around and went back upstream uh, to get away from her. And years ago, I interviewed a, a fisherman in Alger County in the UP who had a bear that was following him well, he, when he was heading to his vehicle. And he used his fishing rod to keep it at a distance and threw sticks and rocks at it. He wow. was able to make it to his vehicle without being attacked by, actually attacked by the bear. Now, when you when you were in the stream and you say this sow raised a fuss, what what did she do? Uh, she was making a rumbling sound, a warning sound. Uh, that at the time, I wasn't that familiar with black bear vocalizations. Uh, I was much younger then, and uh, I, I it wasn't a growl. It was just a warning sound that she was making. And I I looked and saw the bear standing there. She was about. I don't know, 30, 40 yards away, and I just retreated right away. Now, you you say, you know, it's extremely rare to have a black bear attack a person, but in, in a piece you wrote recent, uh, recently, you do give more examples. Well, yeah. Uh, in 2020, uh, 71-year-old Terry Tadello from Crystal Falls had a, a sow with two yearlings, on a bird feeder on his deck uh, at night. And he, he saw the female leave, or he thought she left, and the cub was damaging the bird feeder. He went out on his, on his porch to scare that yearling away, but the female was in the shadows nearby. When he tried to chase the yearling away, the sow attacked him, and uh, his, fortunately his wife pulled him back in the house and he got a number of scratches uh, and bruises, but he wasn't seriously hurt. Uh, but in Wisconsin recently, more recently, this year, uh, there was a couple that had a female with cubs uh, damaging their bird feeder. And they hollered at the bear, and it came through the window. <laughs> to, and they had to kill it in their house. It came through the window? Yes. Wow. Uh, and I suspect there was more involved than them just hollering at that bear. She obviously felt startled and was acting defensively. She thought her cubs were threatened hmm. from whatever happened. I, and I remember a, a story from a few years ago in the northern lower here about a, a, a bow hunter who actually shot a bear coming up the tree, and they found that it was indeed justified, which is often not the case. Yeah, but... It, 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 hunters are more likely to be in circumstances where they could be attacked by a bear, especially bear hunters. Like uh, Jeffrey Starks was on his first bear hunt ever in the eastern UP in Mackinac County in 2011. He had a sow with cubs on his bait, and the sow came to the base of the tree, and he hollered at her to try and scare her away. Well, it startled her. She came up the tree and grabbed him. Uh, fortunately, he was able to shoot the bear before she hurt him more seriously. Where, now, where, where was that again, Richard? Mackinac County. Okay. Well, listen, hang tight, Richard. We've got to take a break. Uh, we're talking to Richard P. Smith, noted outdoor writer, black bear expert, whitetail expert. You can learn more about him and what he's involved in 
uh, at his website, which is, <laughs> appropriately enough, richardpsmith.com. That's richardpsmith.com. After the break, I want to talk to Richard. Well, what, what do you do then? Because I would think if you see a sow in Cubs, you know, maybe saying something is the appropriate thing, or do you just sit back and be quiet? Also, there's another edition, a new edition of Great Michigan Deer Tales coming out, too. We want to talk about that. And, and, and Richard's always got a lot of things to talk about, so I will pick his brain about that and more coming up after the break. Just a reminder, you can always reach me. My email address is mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com, and my website is mikeaveryoutdoors.com. More with Richard P. Smith right here on Outdoor Magazine coming up after the break. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Houghton Lake on 98.5 WUPS. You can hear us in Holland on WHTC, 1450 AM and 99.7 FM. And you can hear us north of the bridge in the Sioux on News Talk 1400 WKNW. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Versa Skins, a Michigan-made Versa Skins, Michigan-based Versa Skins. Uh, creation of uh, owner Paul Perone, who came up with the concept of why do we spend so much money on different patterned camo hunting clothes? Why not buy one good quality set of gear and then snap on and zip on an outer liner so you could change from blaze orange to snow camo to, to waterfall hunting to whatever? I mean, l- literally, in, in a minute, you can change the skin for the season you're in. That's their motto. Change the skin for the season you're in. Check them out online at versaskins.com. That's versaskins.com. While you're online, I would encourage you to head on over to my website, mikeaveryoutdoors.com, and also visit richardpsmith.com. That's pretty obvious whose website that is. That is the website of Richard P. Smith. Uh, uh, very well-known outdoor writer, outdoor expert, especially when it comes to whitetails and uh, black bear. Richard, you said you were uh, successful in the drawing. What area will you be bear hunting in? In the bear unit, which is it's a very large unit, including North Marquette County all the way over to Houghton and Keweenaw counties. Uh, but I'll be hunting in Keweenaw County. And, and that is where you usually hunt, right? Correct. Uh, I want to go a step back a, a step here, talking about uh, the right gun for a bear. I don't pretend to be an expert on this, but I always thought if I was going to get a gun just for bear hunting, or especially for bear hunting, I'd just use a 12-gauge with slugs. Wouldn't that be perfect? It would, it would work. Uh, I, don't, I prefer a centerfire rifle in thirty caliber over a shotgun with slugs. Uh, but a 12, I've seen plenty of bear shot with 12-gauge slugs. Well, over the years, you've seen plenty of bear, period, haven't you? Yes. Um, before the break, also, you were talking about the guy who was up a tree. He saw a sow with cubs, and he, said, he, he yelled at her, or he said something to try to, to scare her away. Obviously, in that case, that wasn't the right move. In general, what should a hunter or, a, or anybody do, actually? What I do is when I see a sow and cubs approaching a bait, if I don't want them... Uh, on the bait, or because sows with cubs are protected universally, but especially in Michigan, what I do is I, I'll just simply wave my hand. So she sees the movement, sees me in the tree, and most often the female with cubs will turn and lead her cubs away. Uh, if a bear with a sow with cubs is already on the bait, do the same thing. If they don't see me wave my hand, I'll stand up if I'm seated in a tree stand. And uh, so make myself more visible. Don't make any noise. Just make movement to make yourself visible. Uh, so she views you as a threat, a potential threat, and, and walks away without any problem. When you startle a bear, especially a female with cubs, by hollering, catching her totally by surprise, their first reaction is to protect their cubs, and that results in attacks. And there's been other uh, 
bear hunters or deer hunters in tree stands that have startled sows with cubs by hollering at them uh, that have had the same result. I see what you're saying. Yeah, when you say that, it makes uh, complete sense. What is your advice now for folks who uh, who got these tags or, you know, we can buy our tags. We were successful in the drawing. Um it, do you recommend going with a bear guide? Do you recommend doing this on your own? What do you think? Well, for first-time bear hunters who don't have any experience, uh, and especially if they live a long distance from the area they're going to be hunting, uh, hiring a guide is a good idea. Uh, the DNR has a list of hunting guides on their website. All you have to do is put in commercial hunting guides in the search window on the DNR website, and it, all types of hunting guides, but it'll list the ones that guide for bear and where they guide. And uh, how do you how do you pick a good guide though? Because you know, I mean, guides are like all groups of people. Some are going to be good, some are going to be not so good. How do we pick the cream of the crop? Well, l- try and get recommendations. But if you can't get recommendations, contact. Uh, guides in the area where your permit is valid for and ask for references so you can call those references and ask for references of hunters who weren't successful as well as those who were successful uh, to talk to them about their experience with that guide and that helps uh, know helps you know you're getting a good guide here in Michigan, we've got bear hunters who hunt over bait, and we have hunters who run dogs. Why do I never hear about, say, still hunting or spot and stalk hunting for bears in Michigan? Because it's very difficult. Uh, there are hunters who hunt natural food sources, such as acorns or beech nuts or apple orchards, who are successful in taking bears that way. Uh, and some hunters do take bears uh by snow tracking or still hunting in areas where there is abundant natural food, uh, but the chances of success are lower with those methods. Snow tracking, I would think by the time it snowed, all the bears have gone to bed, but obviously not. Well, in, in the UP, the bear season is open till October 26th, I, 26th, think. I believe. Yeah. And occasionally we'll have snow oh, before okay. the season ends in the UP. But it, it, you, bears used to be a bonus animal on deer licenses. During that time, a lot of bears were killed during the November deer season, and snow was very common in the UP during those years. Uh, but now bear season ends on October 26th. Gotcha, gotcha. Hey, listen, let's switch gears a little bit and talk whitetail because you've got a new book coming out. Yes. Uh, the Book 8 of Great Michigan Deer Tales is being printed uh, the week of July 18th, um, I, Lucy and I are going to pick the book up from the printer in Celine on the 22nd of July, and then I have book signing scheduled for the new book at Jay's in Clare on the 23rd and Jay's in Gaylord on the 24th uh, to help start off sales of the book right away. Yeah, you're not wasting any time, are you? No. <laughs> and I bet you'll be down at uh, Woods and Water News, the uh, big outdoor weekend with it, too. Yes, yes. What is the process of publishing these days? Is it is it easier with technology? Is it, Do you have to go outside? Can a person do it themselves? How does that all work? Well, it is easier with technology. However, <clears throat> with the higher paper prices are up, and uh, surprisingly, printers are busy and it took longer to schedule the printing of this new book than it has in the past. Uh, but we've worked, we're working with the same printer we've used before, and they were very helpful in scheduling the printing uh, for July, so it'll be available before fall. And so what these books are <clears throat> is kind of a compilation of just, as, as, the, as the title would say, uh, stories from different deer hunters around the state. Not just stories, great stories. <laughs> great. <laughs> Thank you for that, yes. <laughs> and and I, I write many articles about uh, big deer that are taken every year, but I, the ones that end up in the books, Great Michigan Deer Tales, are carefully selected because there's at least one important lesson, and in many cases, many lessons included in those chapters that 
hunters can apply to their own hunting. Uh, so it's the cream of the crop of the articles that I've written that end up in these books. Well, and, and we could talk for an hour just on this subject about the different topics, but let me ask you a couple of basic questions. In the years that you've been doing this, have you found that these people who shoot these big bucks, is it is it skill and they were targeting this animal, or is a lot of it just plain good old luck? In most cases, it's luck. But there are a few instances where it, it boils down to skill and dedication uh, and experience. In the first two chapters in Book 8 are perfect examples. The first chapter is about the current state record typical crossbow buck that Kerry Shear from Ann Arbor shot in 2017. He had no idea that buck was in the area. Uh, it just showed up following a doe, uh, and he shot it. And, and in fact, he wasn't even going to have the head mounted or the deer entered in state <laughs> records until his twin brother convinced him to do so. But then the second chapter, chapter two, is about uh, one of the highest scoring non-typicals from Washtenaw County taken by Corey Memoring in 2018. He saw trail camera photos of that buck uh, that a friend sent him, and then he sent, set out to try and locate where that buck was spending most of his time. And over the course of a year, he finally pinpointed where that buck was. And amazingly, he happened to kill that buck on the way to his stand on the day, he, the day before Halloween in 2018. Uh, at 24 points, a tremendous, huge, non-typical rack that he specifically targeted and was successful in taking. And there's all of the chapters, there's a mix between both of those throughout the book. Well, he killed it on the way to the stand, which is a good example of why you hunt to and from your stand if, if you know, if, if shooting hours allow. Exactly. Hmm. Are people... Um, open to telling you these stories or do you have to do you have to work on them a little bit to get them to open up most of them are are open uh, but occasionally there's uh, some hunters who are concerned about publicity drawing attention to the area they're hunting and they want to be secretive uh, reduce the chances of that happening and I, I fully understand that and uh, but most people are pretty open when they take a, a buck of the proportions Boone and Crockett or close to it uh, most hunters are more than willing to talk about it. Richard, I realize the book won't be out for a couple of weeks yet, but where do people find it? How do we get it? Uh, well, it'll be at Jay's and uh, other bookstores and sporting goods stores and gift shops throughout the state, or they can order from my website. The website again, richardpsmith.com, richardpsmith.com. Richard, always a pleasure. Good luck in the woods, and we'll talk again. All right. Well, good luck to you, too. I appreciate that. Richard P. Smith, a guy I've known for a lot of years. The first time I ever met Richard was at an outdoor writers conference in the Keweenaw, his beloved Keweenaw. And um, that's the first time I ever saw a black bear, in fact, was uh, was 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 with Richard P. Smith and my mentor, Pete Jonas. Got to take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine show. When we come back, I'll talk more about that and a few other things as well. Just a reminder, my website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. That's MikeAveryOutdoors.com. And my email address, Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. You can always reach out questions, comments, criticisms, suggestions. Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show on more than 30 stations across our great state of Michigan, including WTIQ in Manistique, that's 1490 AM, 95.3 FM. And in Saginaw, you can hear us on WSGW, 790 AM, 100.5 FM. I'm in the studios of WSGW right now. For this three hours, this one small corner of the building, I, I kind of I borrow it from Pat Johnston. This is like his studio. This is his domain. And he graciously allows me to sit here for three hours. And I do appreciate Pat. Uh, Pat doing a wonderful job, as always. Uh, could not do the show without uh, the help of the folks here at WSGW. 
This segment of Outdoor Magazine, by the way, brought to you by uh, the good folks from Reader Landscaping. Reader can take care of your lawn and property because it's your nature and our nurture. Let Reader create an outdoor getaway in your backyard. Um, we had some uh, family members um, at the house uh, last weekend for the 4th, and we were sitting out there on the patio around a fire pit just looking around thinking, boy, this is so nice and so uh, relaxing and so uh, comforting. And I have the folks from Reader uh, in, in large part to, to thank for that. They've done a great job for me, as they will for you as well. Again, check them out online at ReaderLandscaping.com. That's ReaderLandscaping.com. I always enjoy my uh, conversations with Richard Smith. Uh, he's been around the outdoor indus- industry longer than I have which is saying a lot. And I go back to the first time we met again. It was at a Michigan Outdoor Writers Conference in Copper Harbor, uh, the Keweenaw. And we went out to what at the time were, you know, legal and very well-known dumps. And, man, did those dumps become a, 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 a magnet for bears. And I'd never seen, a, never seen a bear before in the wild. But I wanted to get some video of him. At the time, I had the old Outdoor Magazine TV show. My mentor, Pete Jonas, is the guy who introduced me to Richard P. Smith and so many other people in the outdoors. It was, it was through Pete that I had the opportunity to meet and spend some time and interview Fred Bear. So I, uh, Pete's gone now, but I, I owe a lot to Pete. He was a, a great mentor, a great friend, and really opened a lot of doors for me. And I could never thank him enough. Uh, for that. But Richard, of course, was uh, uh, very familiar with bears. He'd spent a lot of time around bears. And, you know, so we're, we're in this dump. And uh, he said, yeah, come on out. You know, you get some video. I'm like, eh, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know if I want to do that. And he says, trust me, it'll be okay. So I get out of the, the truck or whatever we were driving at the time. We get the camera up there on the tripod. And this big old boar starts to wander through the through the dump, and I'm I'm getting a little bit nervous. I I don't like this at all. And Richard's like, "You're fine." I'm watching his body language. I can tell, you know, he's he's not aggressive. If we're not aggressive to him, everything will be good. And it was. Um, but it was at that point that I realized, boy, this guy, this guy being Richard P. Smith, this guy knows what he's talking about. So I stayed in touch with Richard. And I do not hesitate to reach out to him. I have learned probably more about bear hunting from Richard than I have from anybody. These days, it's become an absolute passion of mine. I have two hunts coming up here in the next couple of months. The first one will be in White River, Ontario, Canada, with Ron St. Louis of Northern Wilderness Bear Outfitters. That's in mid-August. Now, again, I I did have uh, uh, Ron on in the first uh, hour of this week's show. If you didn't get your Michigan bear tag or if you just like me and you love bear hunting so much you'd like to do another one because you can buy a bear tag over the counter in ontario it's not like you have to go through a period of you know multiple years and draw the tag you can buy them over the counter uh and and ron says he has a few openings if you want to go on that hunt i'll be there this this is the kind of the, the cool thing about this hunt is if you want to do something like this, but you're a bit hinky about it because you've never done it before, maybe a bit nervous about it, this is a great opportunity, a great option for you because this is something I can personally vouch for. I have been there more than a dozen years myself, and I will be there myself in, in August. So I'm not, I'm not going to I'm not going to suggest you go on a hunt that I wouldn't do myself. No, I'm going to be there. The website for that is uh, northernwildernessbearoutfitters.com, northernwildernessbearoutfitters.com. You can get Ron's contact info there, or just send me an email, mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com, mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com, and I can make the connection between you and Ron, and I'll see you up there. My second bear hunt will be in the Newberry Bear Management Unit. I'll actually be hunting near Sini with Johnny Bowler, the Bear Whisperer. Uh, this will be the second time I've hunted with Johnny. The first time I was using a recurve, we had the bait, uh, the blind set up uh, using a, uh, um, a Wraith 270 see-through blind from Primal Tree Stands. Set up, I mean, like 10 yards from the bait, 12 yards. I mean, I was right on that bait, which makes for an interesting hunt. Uh, Johnny did put a bear in front of me, but I was not able to get a shot. This time, I'm going to use a rifle. 
I'm going to use a, a Michigan-made Brenton USA in 350 Legend. So we're going to be able to move that wraith back away from the bait. And I am, even though it's the third season, I am, I'm cautiously optimistic I will get a shot at a Michigan bear. So I don't know. If I had a choice between taking a, another Ontario bear and taking a Michigan bear, I'd take the Michigan bear. But I do love my bear brats on the grill. And I have a lot of people who, who count on me for bear meat. So maybe, maybe if I get the chance, I'll take two of them this fall. And then there's deer hunting, which honestly, most times I could care less about. But that's another, that's another story. That's a whole other story. We'll take a break here in the out. But I do have a lot of walleye to catch between now and then, too. We'll take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine Show. When we come back, we'll wrap it all up with wild game chef extraordinaire Dave Miner that's coming up after the break right here on Outdoor Magazine. Welcome back to Outdoor Magazine. My name is Mike Avery, also known as The Big Guy. And it is my pleasure, it is my honor, and a true blessing to be able to sit at this microphone for three hours each week talking about the great outdoors here in the great state of Michigan and occasionally beyond. I say we talk about hunting and fishing and shooting and trapping and conservation issues and wildlife issues and, of course, wild game cooking and we wrap up each week's show with my good friend and wild game chef extraordinaire dave miner david welcome back how you doing buddy very very good i got my food plots in uh things are looking great there's a lot of deer around man i'm i'm getting geeked already (laughs) excellent i bet you i bet you're uh wishing you could get some rain on those food plots though yeah well we got them in uh day before yesterday Mm -hmm. um and uh I got them all uh, rolled in and all of that. I bought brassica this time for one of them, and uh, we just had such a wonderful clover crop. I just couldn't see plowing it under. You can add to. Hey, did you put in for a bear or an elk tag? Uh, somehow or another, I forgot. No, oh, day. First <laughs> time it. ever, I ever forgot to put in for the wife for because I got a cow, you know, so yeah. I have ten years before I can do anything, but. Don't tell her I said so. I won't tell her a word. Nobody, nobody listening will tell her either. Did you get one of each? No, no. Well, I, no elk because nobody ever gets an elk tag except for you. You're the only guy who's ever gotten one, I think, in the history of Michigan. But I did get my bear tag, so I'm excited about that. Oh, good, good. What what is that? You got the last season. I got again? that. I got yeah. I got the third season in Newberry again uh, um, oh, because I'm, I'll go up there and I'll be hunting with Johnny Bowler, and I'm really looking forward to it. You know me, Dave. I love bear yeah. hunting. I know you do. I do, too, but I just, you know, being with the restaurant, I just can't get away like that. I get it. I get it. So, listen, do we have time for uh, a quick recipe? Sure. We got stream-sized trout. uh, Other than just frying them in some butter, you know, I got a nice recipe with uh, uh, dried cherries. So you want to take the plate-sized trout. If you got a bunch of smaller ones, this works really good, too. But I'm talking like the 10, 12-inch fish. You want to clean them and debone them. Uh, what you do is you gut them, remove the gills, and then take your fillet knife at the head and go right down the rib cavity and uh, peel that right away from the meat. You know, it's real easy to do. And then once you did get that, then you take your forefinger and your thumb and you run it along your back, and boom, the bones come right out. So flour to dredge, juice of a lemon, the juice of an orange, um, about two cups of uh Fresh diced up bread, small dices, a couple of eggs, about a half a onion, half a cup of onion, maybe medium, medium sized onion to dice it up real fine. About a quarter cup each of the green, red, and yellow peppers. Dice that up. A couple ounces of black cherry schnapps. Um, about three quarters of a cup of cherries because you want a lot of tr- cherries in this, the tart cherries, you know. And about a half a tablespoon of tarragon or your favorite spice. I like basil in this too. A couple cloves of garlic, a couple tablespoons of chopped parsley, half a stick of butter, and a cup of white wine. So you're going to make mix all of this together basically and make sure 
that uh, you saute the vegetables up for just a little while, and then add the breadcrumbs, the beaten up eggs, the citrus, about three quarters of the citrus juice, because you want to save a splash for sauce, the cherries and everything. Blend it really well after you saute them vegetables. If it's a little soupy, add some more breadcrumbs to it. And if it's not, uh, if it looks too dry, put a little milk in it maybe. Okay, you want to pack the body cavities with uh, this mixture. Roll the fish in flour, and then a real nice hot pan. You're gonna you're gonna do this in batches too. Brown it on one side and very gently turn it over. Brown it on the other side. Place them in a uh, casserole big enough for everything. 350 degrees. You want to uncover them for about 15 minutes or so tops. You want to check sure you can lift up one top of the uh, meat there, and if it's Looks like raw meat, put it back down and put it back in the oven for a while. So when you get them all done, uh, you're going to take uh, a dinner fork like you're going to eat with. And starting with the head, you stick one tine underneath the skin and then roll it back, just like you're peeling it right off. Okay? Get these, um, when you get that done, set them back in the oven for a little while. Wipe out the pan with a uh, paper towel and take... Uh, well, I would say maybe a half a stick of butter, some uh, parsley. The, uh, you could put a little lemon juice. You could put some of the cherry schnapps in it. Reduce it down till it's thick and creamy. Set that on a plate and then put the fish on top. And if you top it with a little bit of parsley or if you had some toasted almonds, man, it would just be great. I love stream fishing, and if I ever get to retire, I'm going to go right back to it with a vengeance. What do you mean? It. What do you mean, if? Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> someday, someday it might happen, you know. Someday. I've been here 35 years, and I just love it. Oh, and, and, and I know you do, David. You do such a great job. But, yeah, I, I hope that you can I hope that you can retire and get back to more hunting and fishing and less cooking up hunting and fishing. Anyway, I'll let you go, buddy. Uh, where do we find the old Dixie in real quick? I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oscar and Joy's. Yes, me too. I say the same thing all the time. Right on the corner of walk and don't walk. Oh, wait a minute. No, that's Birch Run Road and Dixie Highway and the beautiful Birch Run right there at the southeast corner of the intersection. All right, buddy. We'll talk to you next week. Wild Game Chef extraordinaire Dave Miner, a big part of the Outdoor Magazine show, as are you, because if you weren't listening, there'd be no reason to do this show. My website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. My email address, Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. And I will talk with you next time right here on Outdoor Magazine.